Welcome to Holistic Wisdom Live. My name is Elena. My name is Alejandro. And today we have two beautiful special souls, Sheila and Marcus Gillette. And we're going to talk about such a wonderful topic. I actually have been wanting to talk about for a while. So thank you. Also, we've read your book, The Art of Relationships. And I would say that what a perfect timing for releasing this book, because we are shifting from an old paradigm of couples coming together out of a need, out of woundedness, and into the new paradigm of connecting on a soul-to-soul -soul level, a level of holiness, as Sheila said somewhere before, which I love that. And I wanted to introduce you first. So over the past 25 years, uh, you guys have empowered and educated thousands of people worldwide through intimate conversations with Theo. Sheila has been a direct voice, medium for Theo, which is a collective of 12 archangels since her near-death experience in 1969. In partnership with Marcus, Sheila has been able to share Theo's wisdom with an ever-widening community, imparting upon them incredible messages that foster an enlightened state of consciousness. Before meeting, both Sheila and Marcus were on their own spiritual path. Sheila had only been channel channeling Theo for over 25 years, and Marcus was in the midst of a spiritual truth-seeking journey, inspired in part by Theo's teaching after reading Sheila's first book, The Fifth dimension channels to new reality but after a divinely guided meeting and an instant connection in 1997 their impact on the world grew along with their love having been inspired by sheila's work and enthralled by theo's message marcus not only supported sheila he aligned with her their partnership has allowed them to expand and grow as a couple a business, and as a source of transformative wisdom, all thanks to Theo. Their mission has always been clear, to spread Theo's life-changing guidance as far and wide as possible. It is a notion that has influenced their decisions for almost three decades. With every move, Sheila and Marcus work consciously to ensure their next step centers around providing the most impact for their community. Thank you for this remarkable body of work that you're sharing with the world. And I wanted to briefly touch upon your moment when you discovered each other and what has happened, Marcus, for you and for Sheila. Well, when do you want to start, Sheila? You want to you want to start with um... you start. Okay, I'll start. my my uh, my experience in meeting Sheila started, and I'll I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of this. Started in the parking lot of a grocery store, as uh, you may have read in the first chapter of the book, where I got guided. Literally heard the words, "Go give her your business card." There was a woman I had exchanged hellos with in the in the uh, Safeway. Uh, grocery store here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I and I started arguing with my voice. I said, there's no reason for me to go give her my business card. Why would I do that? I'm not interested. It wasn't any wasn't any love connection. I wasn't interested in, in any of that. Uh, but I heard no, go, go 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 give her your business card. So I had by that time gotten just tuned in enough to that voice to know that I probably shouldn't pay attention. So I went and gave her, knocked on the window, gave her my business card. And she probably thought I was some kind of a some kind of a stalker or something. And um and I did that, uh, followed my guidance. About a week later, she called me and it turned out she was a, a delightful lady. Uh, we went, my, one of my best friends from college was in town at the time. The three of us went out to dinner. Uh, we, we got talking about all the spiritual stuff, uh, as was, was kind of my joy, certainly, at that time, as I had been awakening uh, for a few years before that. Anyway, she turns out she's from Santa Fe, New Mexico. She'd moved to Scottsdale. She was a friend of Sheila's. And she and my buddy from college ended up living together for five years. So the two of them came together. And she ended up giving me Sheila's first book, The Fifth Dimension, and the uh, Channels to a New Reality. And that book was a game changer. You know, guys, when you 
when you read something that you've just been waiting for. And that, that was that book for me. The Fifth Dimension uh, was, uh, I, 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 to this day, am, am convinced that she had to write that book just so she could meet me. But uh, we, we ended up um, becoming very good friends with her friend Donna, was her name. And um, Donna called me a couple of years later and she said, hey, uh, Sheila's coming to town. Would you like to meet her? And I said, I would love to meet Sheila. And, uh, and, we, and then we did on a rather fateful Thursday night, didn't we, Sheila? We did. We did. Donna said to me, um, when you're coming to town, can we get together for a glass of wine when you get here? And I said, of course. And I had that happen a lot. I traveled a lot with the work that I was doing. And when I would go into a city, if I had friends there and we'd make contact, uh, invariably somebody would say, I have somebody I want you to meet. Well, she said to me, I have a couple of people I'd like you to meet. And I said, that would be great. And so this was in March and I was traveling to Arizona to do a talk in April. So we made plans to meet. It was April 10th. I'll never forget. And uh, we planned to meet at the Phoenician Resort here in, in Phoenix, which is a beautiful, beautiful resort. And so I flew into town. Uh, my best friend, an artist that lived here, she and her husband, picked me up at the airport and I was staying with them. And so they came with me to have this glass of wine with Donna and her two friends. So we showed up at the Phoenician and it's a beautiful lobby. And then you go outside onto this beautiful patio that had fire pits and all kinds of things. So we went outside and Nana was there with, with Chip, Marcus's friend. And we sat down at a table and began having a great conversation. And Marcus wasn't there yet. And I felt this energy come in the building. Now, I have a lot of psychic phenomena that happens to me and energy exchanges and, and things. So it wasn't unusual to feel a really strong energy. But then I started questioning, where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. And I just casually was looking around thinking, where, where is it? You know? <laughs> and so we were in the conversation as we're having our conversation just like this. And Marcus walks up to the table from my right side. And I felt him come up and I looked up and I literally felt like I was hit in my chest. I couldn't breathe. You know, those love songs that say, you take my breath away, all that stuff. Well, it's true, but it was bigger than that. I really, he took my breath away and I knew he had read my book. So he knew more about me than I did about him. So I just looked at him and I said, well, what's your story? <laughs> and he said, He's a good talker, thank God, because it gave me a window of time that I could catch my breath. And so we started the conversation and started a friendship. But my whole mind was, who is this? Why is this energy so strong? Because it was much farther beyond, oh, isn't he cute? You know, isn't he attractive? It was bigger than that. It was like, Oh, this there's something here that's really large. And uh, what if he doesn't get it? What if he doesn't feel that? Mm -hmm. So that was my greater concern. So I'll turn it back to you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was a little oblivious because I was meeting a woman who I admired, obviously. I'd read her book and I, I was a fan of, of her and, and Theo. And she was much prettier than she than the picture on the back of the book. And I was just very taken by her. And Enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, about um, the next night, Chip and Donna and I went and saw Sheila um, speak in Channel Theo at an event in, uh, in in Phoenix. And then I had the opportunity to meet Theo personally, uh, personally in a, um, a private session, I, I, which I split with a friend of mine, another friend of mine. Uh, and we uh, and that was my introduction to Sheila and Theo. And we became friends. I became a client. Uh, we. Uh, we just we just got to know each other. You know, we were. I was I was talking to Theo a little bit. Uh, it was it was amazing. You know, I was just super happy to have had this 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 more intimate connection with Sheila. 
And then we had been talking, friends of mine and I had become friends with the uh, Havasupai, uh, the, the medicine men and the tribe, uh, the Havasupai Indians in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And we uh, were planning a trip in April. Uh, we'd been, we'd been down there several times, uh, taking people on vision quests. And uh, they were sharing their, their ceremony and sweat lodges with us and so forth. And we had a, a lovely relationship with them. And I said to Sheila, would you like to go to the Havasupai with me? And I called her in, uh, gosh, I guess it was the beginning of May. I called you and said, hey, we're going to go to the Havasupai. You want to come with me? And I couldn't. My, I really wanted to go because it's a place that's an amazing place number, for one, one aspect. Um, very spirit, you can do a vision quest. And I was very curious. And um, so I, he called and he said, we're going to go May, mid-May. And can you come? And, and my heart dropped because I went, no, I can't. I had been planning um, I've been invited to do a talk in Anchorage, Alaska, and it happened to be that time. And I said, oh, this has been planned for months. I, you know, I'm committed. And so we, hung, I said, well, maybe next time. And we hung up the phone and it immediately rang. And I picked up the phone and it was the people, the organizers in Anchorage that were creating the event I was going to speak at, and they were postponing it. And so they said, is it okay if we postpone? I said, yes, absolutely. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and I called him back immediately and I said, I could go, I could go. So that was our first date, going camping for five days. <laughs> I went, I went, uh, Alejandro, I know you probably would agree with me. I'm not recommending that for anybody, right? To you know, take take your date on a, on a, on a five day first date down into the Havasupai. But we did have we we um we we got down there. We we had some experiences before we went down there together. And then when we got down there, one of the one of the things. It's a very um, just for context. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's the people, of the blue green waters, and it's waterfalls, and 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 just a, a, it's it's almost indescribable how beautiful this place is. And it's about eight miles up from the Colorado River, and the hikes and the waterfalls. It's just it's just the the caverns and the crystal caves, and it's it's really quite a magical place. Sheila and I ended up taking several. Water groups down. is the color of my earrings. Wow, yeah, oh, really? It is. Oh, you'll have to tell us not, afterwards exactly where to go. Yeah, highly, yes. highly recommend it. It's 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 very electrical too. I'd had, wow. uh, I did experience and witness some miracles down there as well prior to us going down there. But I think maybe one of the most profound things for us in terms of understanding who we were together as we were falling in love with each other down there uh, was the experience that we describe in the book of being uh, sitting outside of a sweat lodge. There was two native children. Uh, one was a granddaughter of the uh, our friend whose land we were uh, camping on. The other was her cousin. She was six and he was 11 or 10 or 11, I think. And they were playing outside of the sweat lodge. And Sheila and I had the simultaneous collapse of time and space. Uh, we had a past life recall. And what happened was simultaneously as we, everything changed. It's difficult to describe, but everything changed in a moment. We saw a different landscape we saw each other in different clothing we saw the children in different clothing things shifted in our in our vision and i looked at her and she looked at me at the same time and she said are you experiencing what i'm experiencing right now and we began to describe to each other what we were experiencing in that moment um and you know we've all had phenomenal experiences or extraordinary peak spiritual experiences and lots of people share stories of collapsing time and space and having these amazing experiences which is kind of our new normal now but uh, but to do it together, you know, to have that simultaneous experience was so confirming. And so we, you know, we just, whoa, and, you know, we, we came out of that experience. Uh, I think there was some transformation, but there was also some confirmation that took place in that experience. And we just, we just had, a, had an amazing time uh, down there together uh, for those five days. And then we came back out and we came to my house here in Scottsdale, where we, which is where we live now. 
And we had a group of people come over to the house that night, the, the next night to meet Sheila and Theo, friends of mine that I'd been talking about Sheila uh, to. And we had an experience with Theo and then Sheila and I went outside that night and we sat outside. Uh, it was a beautiful night out outside, just listening to music and hanging out. And and I and I said to her, so my God, uh, this has been amazing. What are we going to do on our on our on our second date? And she told me, I don't date. I love that. <laughs> when I read that in the book, I said, Oh, she sounds like my human being. <laughs> Yeah. Like, and then what did you say, Marcus? And I just said, well, I guess we'll have to get married. And those words were not programmed prior to that moment, right? So that moment was a was a uh, just a pure expression <laughs> I know of of my soul saying, uh, "You're not letting this one get away," right? So um, that was that was really from there there on. We uh, we've been together literally ever since that night, and it was. I guess uh, he really got it. You know, my worry about Willie, Willie realized this is bigger than both of us. I guess he did. <laughs> Have you ever said that before, Sheila, to anyone that you don't date or never? Yeah, because I didn't. I didn't have time, nor a desire. You know, after after being married before and having children and, you know, it just, I was so focused on my work. Not that I was adverse to having a relationship I just didn't need it I wasn't you know I didn't need to have a relationship to have it, my life be great because it was great and um so you know I there was the dating scene wasn't something I enjoyed it was it, you know it just was too too much and I told I told a friend of mine that, went, that knew I wouldn't date. I said, if I'm going to be in a relationship, he's going to have to come knock my door down because I'm not in a <laughs> I'm going to meet anybody. But I didn't think about my work. You know, I didn't think I'm constantly meeting people, but that never crossed my mind at all. That that's how that would happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure glad it did. You know, it's so great. It's I was just like you. I was married before with four children. And I remember being on my own for a while. And my dad came to my place and he said, I'm really concerned about you because all I see you do is work and kids and you're not even putting yourself out there. And I said, I'm not interested. So <laughs> that's why I said, Sheila, you're my person. And then a friend of ours introduced us on social media. And I remember looking at Alejandro's profile. I said, oh no, this is not going to work. I'm in Florida and he's in California. And he said, he looked at my profile and said, oh no, she's in Florida. I'm not moving there. <laughs> we were, we had a long distance relationship. I was in Colorado and Marcus was in Arizona, a little bit closer for yes. sure. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, shoot, it just slipped my mind as you were talking about the, oh, your father saying, I'm worried about you. I had a two-year-old grandson that my daughter dropped off at my house. I was going to watch him for a while. And he said he was coloring his picture and he looked up at me and he said, Grandma, why don't you have a dad? <laughs> and I said, well, and I told him his grandfather, my children's father, was my dad for a while. Maybe <laughs> more figuratively than not. Dad. And he said, and he just had this worried look on his little face. And then he looked up and he solved his problem. He said, Grandma, you can borrow my dad till you get one of your own. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was fine. It was like he solved the problem. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. It was so cute. You can borrow my dad till you get one of your own. And then it wasn't long after that I met Marcus. Yes. And it's it's fascinating. I think with new relationships that are coming together or the soul, truly deeply soulful relationships, there is a knowing. And then for us, when we did meet finally, we saw each other for the first time, four days, eight days, and then Alondra just moved. He moved from California to be here with me. <laughs> and some people probably thought we were nuts, but it's just divinely guided when you know, you know. Mm -hmm.
Well, we had we had a very similar response when we got together. Yeah. I, family, friends. You, you you've been on how many dates? You were you were together for how long? You know, but, <laughs> but you know, like with you guys, which is so inspiring. But when you know, you know. That's My daughter is. said to me, "Well, what does he do for a living?" I said, "I have no idea." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. I didn't know what he did. It wasn't about any of that. <laughs> she was like, oh my God, here she goes. <laughs> yes. And maybe it's a Piscean thing for people who are watching. So the, all four of us are Pisces and we're absolutely, I think, so guided and deeply connected to trusting the universal guidance. And I wanted to start with, because you do talk about it in your book, where how important it is to make a list of what your ideal partner should be like. And when we met, Alejandro said to me, I made a list. And mm-hmm. and actually, he shared it with me a couple of days ago after reading your book. I said, do you still have your list? Well, she asked me about it uh, <laughs> a week ago. And I said, you know, I, I'm sure it's in my notes. I don't know where. And I just happened to find it. I was going through my notes, yes. you know, my phone, looking for other things. and. We go, oh my God, here it is. So I, <laughs> it is guided. I have no doubt that it yeah. is because it needed to. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. And you talk so about you, the importance of that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find, Alejandro, that as you looked at that list now, you probably, I'm sure you saw that, that Elena checked off all the boxes. But my question is, did they check off the boxes of who you were at that time? Were you that, that you were seeking? You know, I was, I think I, I might have been, I was not uh, aware of well, you it. Have been, by the way, I'm answering my own question. You must have been or else we wouldn't be yes, looking at the right uh, Definitely going back because yeah. I remember uh, making um, a commitment to myself that I wanted to be that, you know, first. Yeah. And I even um, decided to stay away from dating. And, and yeah. I, I didn't date for a year, a little over a year. To where I said, now I'm going to commit to myself fully. I'm going to connect and trust myself and pay attention to my inner voice and really get to know myself and be very comfortable with myself. So when I met her, she was definitely that, very comfortable with herself and uh, trust to herself. So it was was without a doubt a, a vibrational match, I can say, yes. Well, here's the, here's the beauty of what you just said. As you look at that list, and this is, in my opinion, this is part of the secret sauce. When you looked at that list of all the things you desired in a mate, you could, if you were not yet, you could make the decision at that point to become that in which you're seeking, right? So you could go through the whole list and say, well, I, maybe I got a little work to do here, or, you know, I could kind of up my game here or, or go a little deeper inside, to, you know. So funny story real quick on, on lists. <laughs> Our daughter... Uh, was uh, living in Los Angeles, and we and, and she gave us her permission to share the story with you because we shared it in the book. Um, uh, in chapter five, she uh, called us up. We were we were in town. Let's see, Sheila. We were, yeah, we were living here in Scottsdale. This is about four years ago. She called, and we're going to we we're going to California, we're going to Los Angeles to do an event. And, and we called her up and told her we're coming to town. We want to take her out to dinner and hang out with her a little bit. And we were doing a retreat in, in uh, Los Angeles. And she said, hey, I want to introduce you to my new boyfriend. We said, great. And it had been about three months. They've been dating. It was time to introduce this young man to uh, to the parents. So I get a phone call about 5.30 the evening we're meeting. We're supposed to meet at 6.30 for dinner. She says, oh, dad, you know, David just called. He's going to be late. And she's kind of complaining a little bit. And I said, don't worry about it. We'll just go and We'll hang out. We'll meet you guys when you get there. And so they came. He was a delightful young man, actually nice guy, really nice kid. And we we uh, had a nice dinner. And then at the end of dinner, our daughter is coachable. We found out she brings out the list that we had instructed her years ago to write out all the things that you wanted in a mate. And as she brought the list out, she said, "There's one thing missing on my list right here, and that is punctuality." It was she had not written down on her list and had attracted a, a maid who was, in fact, not evidently not very punctual. But the, the moral of that story is be as specific as you possibly can and cover the, all the bases 
it would be amazing at what uh, how you can manifest that. And unfortunately, that relationship did not work out, but um, probably not because he wasn't punctual, I don't think. Mm. <laughs> what I love, first of all, I want to share a quote from your book. It's Dalai Lama's quote. Remember that the best relationship is one in which your love for each other exceeds your need for each other. And for those fortunate people, some fortunate people that understand this, and, and I'm hoping that most of people will understand this quote and live it and breathe it. And this is, I feel, is the paradigm shift in relationships of going into relationship out of a need, some kind of need, unfulfilled desire uh, that is never going to be fulfilled in another person and shifting into the greater love. And I wanted to, to talk about that. Uh, how you're seeing that in people that you've helped, you've worked with. I know that you do discuss it in the book. So whichever one of you wants to uh, expand on that. Sheila, your, Sheila mic your, your mic's muted. Hi. Your mic's muted. I want to talk first. I better unmute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, Theo says the new paradigm of relationship is preferential, not needy. To your point, Elena. So, and and to yours, Alejandro, when you said you worked on yourself, the new way to do is fill your cup. You know, don't expect somebody outside you to do that because they can't. It's impossible. And oftentimes when we get in relationship, there's this little part of our wounded self that aligns with the woundedness in somebody else with the idea, I'll fix you and you fix me. And that can't work because it's an inside out job. And I'm so glad you shared your process along the road because that's so true. We have a client that said, I'm going to clean up my side of the street. You know, it's really true. We can't expect relationships to be that state of unconditional love that you, to Dalai Lama's statement, if we don't have that for ourselves, you know, and we can't receive it either until we get that inner peace and confidence to know what it is and then be able to know that in another but also experience it in your relationships so we we are strong proponents of this new paradigm of preference not need mm -hmm. wonderful okay. and i have a a question actually that is related to what you just uh, shared um and let me find it here this is <laughs> here yes this is uh, your book explores the idea that relationships are a mirror reflecting back to us our own strengths and weaknesses. How can people use their relationships as a tool for personal growth? And what are some common challenges that people face when trying to do so? Oh, a, yeah. Is, uh, one of the in that mirror is ju is typically judgment. As we judge others, we're judging some aspect of ourselves. I think that's that's number one. So it gives you the opportunity to illuminate, I guess you could say, that with, with, within ourselves, which we need to work with and work on. And and moving from judgment to compassion and acceptance is, would be one of the, the things I would say about that. Theo says, if you live alone, you can be right all the time. And, and by the way, we're not, negating the, the the beauty and the power of living on your own too, by the way. If someone asked this question in one of our uh, programs yesterday about the beauty of living alone, who actually is married to someone, but they don't live together. But other people just like to be alone. They like to be, you know, just together, just with themselves. And what Theo says is don't become isolated. Mm -hmm. Isolation will will ultimately lead to depression potentially, right? I mean, if, you, if you're not, because we know that the, the, I heard uh, uh, Dr. Ned Hollowell talk the other day about connection being vitamin C. I mean, being that that life force is is connecting with others. 
So more specifically to your question, Alejandro, the um, the ability to to be to get to know ourselves at a much deeper level through the interaction with a partner who is honest, who is not uh, anticipating you to fill a wound in them, nor can you in them, right? Um, or nor can they in you. Uh, is it can be magic in terms of our own personal and spiritual development, right? Um, we have an opportunity. Sheila and I have a couple of rules in our relationship. One is that um, we're very, very good in the moment at self-correcting and asking the question, if I had that moment over again, what would I do differently? And anytime we ask that question, we're growing. Anytime that, that we answer that question, there's more self-awareness that comes in that is permanent. The other thing that we do in our relationship is, is we ask ourselves if we ever have a disagreement, which we don't often, but when we do have a disagreement about something, we ask the question, to whom is this more important? If it's more important to you, I don't care as much as you do about something, then we're going to do that, whatever that is, right? So I just think it's a it's a rich, don't you think, Sheila? It's just a really, relationships are such a rich opportunity to further our own self-awareness, our own uh, uh, uh self-discovery, because that's really the soul integration process that Theo teaches about understanding the core patternings in which beliefs are adopted or created that are not true about ourselves. We have the opportunity to find out really how lovable we really are within relationships. Wouldn't you say, Sheila? Yeah, definitely. And Theo says the difference between judgment and observation, we might just be observing something and it's not that kind of mere pushback thing. Or if we're judging it, there's an emotional component. And that's when we get into projection. And with judgment, it's emotionally charged. With observation, it's neutral. It's just, oh, isn't that interesting? And we also have do-overs. If, if we get crossways, like Martha said, it's not often, but we're very strong, both of us, very strong people. So if we don't agree on something, we, and if we are a little tense or grumpy, we can have a do-over. And oftentimes, you know, if I get grumpy and my tone gets grumpy, and then I'll go, oh, let's start this over. Let's, let's do a do-over here. Let's start this conversation again. And that's really important because we, as humans, get attached, you know, and and we all have a little warrior in us thing, you know, <laughs> the self-righteousness. We check that. We check it. Um, and I think it's mindfulness. It's awareness. You know, instead of just being reactive in life, it's being responsive. So when we become reactive... We check it. We we go, hmm, what's going on here? And one more thing. I just have to add, we keep a sense of humor about it all. I, I, you know, one of the things, one of the secrets to life, in our opinion, and according to Theo as well, is we take ourselves too seriously. So we need to be more lighthearted. We need to be uh, capable of finding the humor. And that's an observational thing. That's not when you're in the moment, of course, if, if, if there's something going on. But boy, if you can just, you know, get yourself out of that, whatever it is, and find the humor in whatever's going on. We have a we we do a lot of laughing in our relationship, and I know you guys do too. And it's it keeps it um, keeps it fun, keeps it loving, keeps our hearts open. Really, is what it does. And so that's one of the things in the in the new online course coming out, guys, on the art of relationship uh, in the next few months. Uh, we we talk with Theo a, a little more than we do in this book about humor about. Uh, finding that, you know, putting those childlike glasses of awe and wonder on as often as we possibly can and not take ours. I, one of the things that I, I've asked Theo in the past, what do you find most funny about us? And they say everything, but we most particularly <laughs> find, but, what we most particularly find funny about you is that you tend to take yourselves very seriously in our observation of, of human beings. So we try to keep that one at the forefront of everything we do together in our relationship. That's great. I know for me, the best way to deal with a lot of situations and best best reflections is Alejandro always puts humor to how he sees me and that just like this morning right we're, we're 
we actually thought our interview, I'll share it. We thought the, I thought the interview you was at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the interview was at 10. I made him ready early and we're sitting. And he's like, imagine if I did that, what would you say? He's like, you'll be shooting me with what? What did you say? I'll be shooting you with. But anyway, he puts humor into the situation. And that just kind of makes everything so much better. And mm -hmm. this is one of my favorite things that Alejandra does in our relationship and the way we communicate. So mm -hmm. yes, definitely agree with that. You know, Marcus said to me last night, what's the one thing why you marcus you could repeat this better but what's the one thing why you love me i he said it much more eloquently and it was like what you know what what's that question and what i told him he gives me the opportunity to be my best self mm -hmm. I want to be my best self in our relationship. And I think that's, you know, thinking back, there's so many things, but that's the one thing. And also, I see myself as my best self in our relationship. And, and that feels good. It really feels good. So having that energy of me really living up to that expectation and it's not that he has the expectation i just feel that because he inspires me to be that and that was kind of fun after 25 years 26 now of meeting of thinking about what 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 is that what is that one thing that i fell in love with amongst many other but the thing that has stood out all these years was i continue to be growing and being my best self because I want to be that in our relationship and I can't say that that was true before you know it's it's the synergy of the relationship that brings that out you know people can bring that out we can bring that out in our children we can do that in relationship with others as Theo says everything's relational everything we do in life is in relationship to others we go to the supermarket with a checkout person at the, you know, when we go to buy our, our food, we're in relationship with that person in that moment. We're in an elevator. We're in relationship for a, a minute or two with the people in the elevator. We're always relating to people, even if we're looking at the floor in the elevator, <laughs> we're in that energy with, um, with others. So it's an interesting topic. Theo told us, what, four years ago, Marcus, when we said, what's next? What do you want us to do? And they said, relationships. Mm -hmm. So here we are. That's so cool. Yeah. I yeah. love when you, when you, in your book, you talk about how important it is to consciously exit out of previous relationships. And I will say this, whether I was aware of it or not, uh, when I exited out of my previous relationship, you know, looking back, what we did was so unusual because we put our children above ourselves in many ways. And it wasn't about us so much. So we created this peaceful environment for the kids. <clears throat> and I want to talk about that because I think it is crucial in order to attract and bring vibrational matches into our life. It's important that we have integrity when we exit from the relationships that are no longer in alignment with respect and love that is beyond our personality selves. And I think this is the paradigm shift that is happening at the moment, maybe not as often, but I see that it holds such a great potential because you can have healthy children and healthy relationships by doing it in a way that is compassionate, integral, before you meet your next partner. And perhaps you can talk about that because I do know you mentioned it in your book. Well, I know Marcus has probably another statement about this, but it's very true, Elena. And, and that's why we see so many 
relationship issues being repeated over and over and over again. We're not cleaning up our side of the street. You know, we just keep looking for that cup cup in us to be filled filled outside of us. So Theo often says about completing a relationship is remember the love. You love this person when you came together. So love doesn't go away. You know, we want to retain the love. All of the other um, experiences were there to grow us. And so if we can remember, this is a person you love, you're not in love with, but you have loved. And if you can keep that, keep that knowing to your point about your children, it's good for them because they love both parents. You know, unless it's an extreme abusive relationship for them and the, the, the two parents, children love their mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And so if their mom and dad can show that respect and love to each other, whether they're together or not, is so important for them. So I totally agree with what you have to say. Mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also well to remember that the soul's choice was to be in that family. The soul's choice was to be in that relationship or to be a child of these two parents. That context brings in an acceptance that, first of all, it's okay. You know, relationships, we've all heard are for, you know, reason, season, or a lifetime. This might have been just a, a reason or a season, but maybe not for a lifetime. And souls choose to incarnate for the specific purposes of learning whatever it is the soul desires to learn in that lifetime. And I think that the old paradigm of anger, blame, and justification, you know, is is uh, destructive. It's destructive individually. It's destructive collectively. It's destructive for families. And the energetics of what happens in that uncoupling, if you will, in relative to how it impacts the next relationship, like Sheila said, we're going to continue to repeat the patterning if we don't have consciousness or awareness that we don't have to do that anymore. And this gets back, I think, uh, to you know, the, the, the process of self-discovery that Theo has been teaching for, for decades of understanding who we really are, uh, where our beliefs originated, you know, what's the genesis of, of the lack of self-love that we feel within ourselves, you know, what are the, where, where do those, whether it's this lifetime or a previous incarnation, uh, the beliefs were adopted or created that just aren't true about ourselves. So if we, if we know that any belief we hold about ourselves that's not loving is untrue, you know, repeat that, any belief we hold about ourselves that's not loving is simply not true. If we know that to be true, then we're not going to move into blaming and 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 having anger and making somebody the bad guy and wanting to be the the you know the 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 parent who's loved the most, for instance, which is just complete uh, destruction, basically, in terms of the ultimate uh you know ongoing relationships with children in that case. So I think it's just a matter of understanding that everything happens indeed for a reason and that the soul chooses to be in these environments for whatever the learnings are, and then to be able to move into that next relationship with a vibration of peace and love and acceptance and awareness that, hey, that was, you know, look at all the gifts and blessings I got from that relationship, not to mention the possibility that there's children that are the gift and blessing as well, you know? Mm -hmm. That's true. I just thought about a comment I'll make about one of my kids because he was like one of a teacher, my teachers at that time, because when we made a decision to announce it to the kids, this was years ago, he said, you guys created us. So figure it out to not make it about yourselves. And I thought, wow, this is so wise. Wow. And he was 13. Let's see. Yeah, he was 14 years old at that time. And I just thought, this is brilliant. You know, also, we have to give an opportunity to hear what our children have to say in yeah. all of this, because they have a lot of wisdom with less pollution to offer to adults. Sounds like you got an old soul there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She has four old souls. <laughs> yeah, you're blessed, no doubt. You have spoken about the importance of forgiveness mm -hmm. and compassion in relationships. 
Can you share some tips for cultivating these qualities in oneself and in one's relationship? Yeah, that's a, excuse me. It's a great question. Um, I'll just say one thing and I'll pass it over to Sheila. Forgiveness is interesting. It's, of course, it's not for, for the person that we perceive has done us harm. We're for, forgiving for ourselves. And what I, always, what I always find cool about forgiveness is that if we have the awareness that we're actually not forgiving them or we're not forgive, we're forgiving them for a perceived slight that oftentimes wasn't intentional anyway. So you look at the intention involved, oftentimes it doesn't match up with the action. Some people are just unconscious. Uh, the, and to have the awareness that, in fact, wait a minute, we co-created that experience. This isn't, this isn't nothing happened to us. One of the, you know, the tenets of Theo's teachings, and you guys I know teach this, is that life's happening for us, not to us. This is not a, a, a random victim-y thing going on here at all, right? So I think just knowing that you know, it's all the energy, carrying a grudge, not forgiving somebody going forward in your life is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, um, is a low vibration. And it's going to pull you down a little bit, right? To be able to say, hey, it happened, it's over with, whatever your intention was, most of the time it's not intentional, that which we perceive as being a slight to us or, or a betrayal, and that uh, we accept responsibility for the co-creation of that experience in the first place, it's easy at that point to forgive. We don't have to like the human being. Theo says, love the soul, but you don't have to like the actions of that human, right? And the last thing I'll say, Sheila, is just Theo's question about what would love do. You know, that's kind of our, our guiding uh, uh, light, if you will, with regards to the questions we ask ourselves in almost any circumstance, what would love do? And Theo's answer is act with compassion. And I think, Sheila, that's probably the, the, the thing that guides, really it guides us in our lives, but it also guides us within our relationship with each other as well. You know, there's the most powerful words, I think, in any language is I'm sorry. Um, you know, we know when it's spoken to us, how it feels, if it's true, you know, I remember to my children, if they, I would say, don't do that, or you did this or whatever was going on. And they go, okay, I'm sorry, you know, and roll their eyes. Like, I really feel that, you know, but if, if somebody's genuine in there, I'm sorry, however they say it. And it's genuine. We can all feel that. And it's a release of energy that happens. Um, and to the point of forgiveness, I think most of us are confused about forgiveness, really. Uh, but when we learn how to do it, it's not forgiving an act. It's not forgiving the, the event that happens. It's for forgiving ourselves for putting ourselves in that position to have that experience. But it's, it's forgiving the other person for not knowing how to be different. It's not forgiving the event. You know, it happened, how, whatever it was. And some, some people have some pretty severe events in their lives that it's hard to forgive. It's really hard. But when we begin to realize it's holding us back, it's holding us from having the life we want to live, truly. And what I've found in, in my experience, that self-forgiveness is the most powerful because we can forgive somebody else but we keep ruminating on inside of ourselves about the event, about what happened, about, you know, betrayal, whatever it is. And how could I have done that to me? So we, we need to learn how to give it, forgive those parts of ourselves that didn't know any different at the time. We're usually judging from the future, from what we've lived into and how we've grown from that event. We're judging that part of ourselves, that person we were then, and they didn't know any different. They didn't know, or they would have done something different. So, but they were courageous in going through that challenge 
to make us who we are in that moment to have the realization. So I think part of forgiveness is really recognizing the gift and blessing of the growth of who we are today because we had the courage to go through whatever it was that we think we have to forgive. So beautiful. It reminds me of this process, which Alejandra and I talked about, and then I saw it in your book because it's also part, it's part of your work. And it's what we call soul fragmentation that happens not only in this lifetime, in previous lifetimes, um, parts of ourselves that have been heard that we disconnect from and we operate on that. And then you talk about, and that's when a lot of times souls or personalities meet and operate on those fragments. And you talk about incorporating soul integration, which is so important. So maybe we can talk a little bit about soul integration process and what that means from your perspective in the work that you offer. Theo brought this process forward five decades ago. Mm. And they were working individually with people in the soul integrative process because seeing that's where we get stuck, where uh, that part of ourself is frozen in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then a belief externally is created or we adopt it out of a, an opinion from somebody else about who we are, about not being lovable, not good enough, not smart enough, not whatever enough. And we hold on to that. And as I, I spoke about the repetitive patterns that we create to prove that right. So there's different parts of ourselves that are stimulated in their outside, in the outside world that is similar where we go, ah, see, I was right, I'm not good enough, or you know, whatever it is, it's stemming from that moment where that belief first began. So the integrated process allows us to reveal to ourselves what that moment was. That revelation of, oh, that's where it began. It's not a judgment of that part of ourself, but seeing that this is what happened and reframing it. Beliefs can be changed, events won't be changed. They happen, they're our history. They, you know, our history is our growing process, our curriculum. So when we realize that it's an opportunity rather than being victimized by it. You know, everybody gets stuck in their story of victimization. This moves us out of being victimized to changing those beliefs so they're not repeated over and over again and bringing those parts of ourselves home. And where's home? Home's our heart, our soul-centeredness. And really loving on them, whatever age they are, if it's a previous life or it's a younger often a younger version and an older. I mean, we can have that happen today that tomorrow we'll realize, oh my gosh, I need to love on that part of myself from yesterday because, you know, we fragmented in that moment to your point, Elena. Marcus, I know you have more. I would just, I would just say Elena hit it right on the head. I think you described it beautifully, Elena. The fragments, me, that's where the, the you fill up the woundedness and me and I'll fill up the woundedness. And you, the woundedness is what you're talking about. The fragments, the the and the fragments, a beautiful word for it. The only other thing I'll add to what Sheila just said is just to look at it as some people say, well, this sounds very much like inner child or shadow work. And it is that. Uh, people will say, well, it also sounds kind of like soul retrieval in the shamanic traditions. And it is that as well. It's But it's more than that, right? So the, the, the expansiveness of this process is the multidimensionality of it which you just referred to uh, beautifully in reference to uh, understanding the impact that previous incarnations and experiences that we had in previous lives can have on the emotional patternings in this lifetime. Because in, in, a, in as we know, there's no time or space, even though we can't quite wrap our, our, our heads around that one, but we experience it though. That's the beauty of the process. It's almost like a personal shamanic journey or a personal soul uh, uh, past life regression even. We have hundreds and hundreds of clients who've shared stories, thousands of clients who've shared stories with us about connecting into a part of the self from a previous lifetime 
And the awareness, the illumination, the shift, the, the transformation that takes place with that one awareness as to why I think and believe and do the things I do in this lifetime is amazing to observe, right? So that's, I think, what makes this so cool is that it's simple, it's textured, it's layered. There's a lot of nuances to it. We teach a whole six month certification course on this process. We have facilitators all around the world that are uh, assisting others in their in their own transformation and self discovery. But it's profound. It's a profound process, and I think you described it beautifully. Well, you know, Anna, I know, um, and both of you are very much into physical body and healing and optimum health and these things that we're talking about about relationship and forgiveness and all the things we're discussing and integration it allows us to be healthier too because wherever our body is giving us information that it's out of balance there's an emotional component to that and i i would say it's part of our soul integrative process. If we're having a lot of pain, we can go in where the pain is and find out who inside of us, what part of ourselves is uncomfortable. It's not the end all be all. There, there are many things that can be a part of that, but certainly the integrational process is a big part of it. And we found that true in our work as I'm sure you are finding in yours. Yes, just yesterday we had a conversation in our group vibration revelations call where uh, a man who he's in our community, much older gentleman, and he shared that he was having this severe back pain, which he had years ago and it came back. And he he's so self-aware, another Pisces, he said he recognized that he's never been acknowledged for the work after he retired from the university. And he said that he realized he had to hug himself and hold that part of himself. And that recognition took the pain away from his lower back pain went away. And I just thought, wow, this is so simple and yet so profound is allowing to reconnect and love exactly what you share, that part of yourself that has never been acknowledged. And it's gonna show up in the physical body until it is revealed, seen, and loved. Indeed. We have a very good friend. Uh, she's German, and she's a, a, a new thought spiritual teacher and has written many books in Germany. Um, but one of the things that, that she speaks about is my body's the love of my life. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and, you know, I did too when she spoke to, to oh. us about that. And she does that. She gives herself a hug. Mm -hmm. Because loving the body, as you know, with your work, um, is so important for good health. You know, we, we are so, uh, you know, we have to be careful of our self-speak, you know, and our self-judgment and our self-shaming on all levels. And so I love that hug. It, it yeah. makes a difference. It really does. Well, we, well, we should acknowledge, we're talking about a, a lady by the name of Sabrina Fox is her name, yes. who, who shared this uh, with us. She was a guest, special guest on one of our recent retreats. And she has a whole list of questions that she asks about which one applies to you in terms of how you feel about your body. And most mm -hmm. people are more on the the spectrum, if you will, of shame as opposed to love. And it doesn't matter what your physical body looks like. It is the only one you have in this lifetime or how you perceive it looks like. Uh, and to love and it have to be the love of your life. Like Sheila was just saying, it was a beautiful transformation we saw with, with a, a group of uh, clients we were working with that uh, everybody really lit up when they started to get, started asking themselves questions that they never asked before. And that's where transformation takes place. And I know your, your guys' work is so so important and so amazing with regards to vibrational frequencies and understanding, and you understand all this and your community understands all this as well, that every thought we have, every every belief we hold, every everything we do and think and speak has a, has a certain frequency to it. And to Sheila's point, it's it's beautiful when you, when you have that awareness and then your self-talk starts to change and the neural pathways start to change. And then first 
thoughts and desires we have line up with the second and the third that are that are already embedded within our our neural system, right? Um, and you guys know more about this stuff than we do, but I I just think it's wonderful how it all how our work dovetails beautifully in in the uh, uh, together here. Yes, one thing. Sorry to interrupt. I don't know if you were going to say something. It just I came just, to I'm me. Just thinking. Thinking. I'm picking up on my thoughts. Yes. <laughs> you're running have... around. You're running around in his head, Elena. <laughs> we're speaking without words. What came to me, and I, I have this. Actually, people, when if you were to look on my website, I purposely left a picture in my bio, and if you look at it, I look completely different. And speaking about loving yourself. How, and I'm wondering if it happened to you as well, how your physical body changes, the light that you exude completely changes. And it's so noticeable. So if I were to go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I look like a different human being. And I wonder if that has happened for you before you shift happened, where you were looking at yourself and thinking, wow, I can't believe that was me. But that was the wounded part, the the unawakened part, of course, that you can love now and appreciate the journey that you've been on. But I wonder if you see that in people that you work with, but also within yourselves. Oh, yeah, that's the best part of doing this work, isn't it? You see the transformation in in yourself and others. Um, Certainly, I I tell people doing this work is the best anti-aging thing you can do. Because you're clearing out all the sludge, you know, you're clearing out all the stuckness in the flow of energy in your body, as well as your mind and your energetic field. So as you become more clear, of course, you're going to change. And that light's brighter. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, when we do events, we do, we do the virtual events, which is wonderful. But when you do a live event and people come in to the event and they look one way. And then at the end, there's transformation and they're just shining, you know, and glowing. It's to me, that's the gift of doing the work of seeing that transformation. And it does people look totally different than they did when you first interact together i i love that i love that and we're all doing that now who have chosen to be incarnate now that's what theo talks about we're in a time of tremendous consciousness shift that's never happened before and we've signed up we volunteered for it we said i want to do that i want to go on that journey and in doing so we're going to get healthier. We're going to get happier. We're going to interact together as a species, more collaborative and better. So, you know, I'm very optimistic with what's happening now, even in this chaos. Yeah. Because out of the chaos will come the order. All this stuff has to happen to be seen. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, to... It's kind of like you have to have the fever before it can break and everything changes, right? So I see that this is the fever that's really going to cleanse. And when it's released, the growth and the the radiance that's going to come from that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Inside out job. You know, that's the Theo talks about enlightenment as a lightness of being, a lightheartedness. Uh, they've been talking about the state of becoming of this unconditional the state of being of unconditional love. And it's not a feeling or even an emotion, but it's a state of being, it's a vibrational state of being. And I know you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And the inside out job, the inside out part of all this is that as we become lighter and, and become more lighthearted and become more full of our, our own love of self. It, 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 I don't even like an, the word anti-age. To me, it's elegant aging. It's We're going to age, but but we get to do it elegantly. We get to do it in a higher vibration, which means we're going to age. We're going to still remain very healthy, active, passionate, you know, full, you know, vibrant and so forth. So I think it's, I think it's, it really is about 
as the as the self love quotient begins to really emerge from us, how it shows up in the physical is uh, is is absolutely impacting our health in a very big way. And that glow that Sheila that you were talking about, Sheila, you know that we we see people light up. We, and I think that's connection. I think it's soul recognition. It's that it's that resonance. It's having experiences beyond the physical body, and just being in Theo's presence is is that, of course. Uh, and it's uh, I think it's a recognition and a belief and and a, and a, a knowing that we're living in a time of magic and miracles. And wow, what does that mean? What does that? How does that look? How's that going to unfold for us? Every day we wake up with the expectation of that happening, and that I think is what keeps people alive. It keeps people enthusiastic. It keeps people passionate about what they do. And uh, we call it enth and, and enthusiastic anticipation, knowing that something wonderful is going to happen. And that's a question Theo asks, asks us to ask ourselves quite often. If you're thinking, you know, worrying thoughts, what if something wonderful happens in its place of what you're worrying about? And that'll just shift things immediately, you know? That's right. In your book, you discuss the importance of emotional intelligence. Um, in relationships, how can people develop their emotional intelligence? Marcus? That's Jill. <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about in the integrative process. Mm -hmm. um, it's releasing old beliefs that are untrue, that we've held on to, and it's outside ourselves. It's, it's situations and circumstances that have happened in our lives as our curriculum, our challenge to learn and grow from, that we've said, yes, we said, yes, I'm that. And when you have that self-realization, then you can love yourself and really recognize the growth from that experience that you gained rather than having the vision of yourself still being that person you can see who you've become because of it the gift that it whatever it is that created or that you created or adopted a belief about you that's untrue you can see it with different lenses you can you can broaden the aperture of your view, you know, because we, we as humans are pretty myopic about ourselves, you know, it's this way. And so what we're inviting people to do as you are is broadening that, broadening that aperture that you're more than that. And let's look through different lenses about who you are and how far you've come. You know, we can see other people's growth, but we need to see our own. We need to really acknowledge ourselves. To your point of your client, Elena, the gentleman who had the pain that realized he had never been acknowledged. That's the point. We have to acknowledge ourselves for the magnificent beings that we truly are. Yes. And that's emotional intelligence, by the way. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. So beautiful. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the body of work that you've created to share with the world. And please let people know where they can find you. And we're talking about the art of relationships. Yeah, we've got a we've got a gift for your viewers and your listeners at www.asktheo.com forward slash love. That's astheo.com forward slash love. Astheo.com has everything else we're doing. But on this particular page, we have a, a free guided experience with Theo on the topic of relationships. So it's an actual immersive experience or meditation that we, we have available as a gift. And then there's also an opportunity to purchase the book there as well. So we really appreciate so much being able to spend some time with you guys. This has been Thank you. awesome. Really great to get, to get together with you all. Thank you, so Thank you so much. It's been a gift. You guys are a true gift to the world. Thank you so much. Yes. As are you. Thank you for this time. And it's great now knowing you and look forward to another time together. Yeah. Right. Look forward to reconnecting with you guys. Much love. Much Thank love. You. Thank you. Bye.